All right, well, it's been a minute since I've been here. Scotty, normally you and I talk and it's over the phone, <laughs> but it is really good to see you in person. Oh, thank you. How you been? Wow. Busy. Busy. Um, a lot of changes going on. Staffing and setting for the future and and getting people that I've respected in the industry and and um, you're only as good as your people and the people create the products and the products create the sales so without the right people so just uh, busy you know trying to focus on the product but build a staff around me to take it to the next level we'll start one off okay with a biggie okay what was your car choice for the ride into the office today it's a GMC Denali okay but I just got a new Ford, and I'm a Chevy guy, but I love this Ford uh, King Ranch. Okay. I saw this car three years ago, and I was on the lookout, and the last three years have been tough to find trucks. Anyhow, found this truck. I'm in love with it, though I'm a Chevy guy. My father was, but I bought a Ford, and it's a uh, it's the biggest engine. It's a 7.3 liter called a Godzilla gas motor. <laughs> And it's so ridiculous. <laughs> I don't but even it, want to know what the miles per gallon is. It's, on good, like, it's like six. <laughs> but I, I love my trucks. I have an old Ford. I have a new Ford. I drove a Denali in today. But uh, cars inspire me. They make me happy. Uh, that, was, that was the reason why I kicked it off with a car question. So I want to know, how old were you when you first said, I want to make putters for a living? Wow. So my father passed when I was 13 and I spent from ni age nine to um, early 13 um, dreaming with him. He was an insurance investigator and a uh, two handicap, great golfer, and he loved tinkering in the garage. He liked Persimmon Woods. He liked McGregor. He liked George Bear. He loved Tony Pena. And I got hooked over the head, just got hit when the zebra came out. Mm. And it had a head cover, it had a leather stripe, had all the stripes, and it had adjustable sole, so it was interactive. That you could adjust the weight. And I got hooked on putters, so I would try to make putters. And he bought me a tabletop mill for the garage, and at age 10, I'm working on a mill with aluminum. My father overseeing it, then he'd let me go. And um, when he passed, I just kept on making putters because I love the game. Mm -hmm. um, and I would make putters. And every time I made myself a new putter, I was excited and I putted quite well. But then as that putter got old, I got bored with it. Then I started not even thinking about it and putted poorly. So every time I had a new putter, I got excited. Yeah. So I think even in today, I, when I get excited, you know, about a new product, I got some new Titles and Irons. Um, Bill got them for me. And um, T100. T100s? Maybe 150s. 150s. Okay. Yeah. A little bit, little bit more speed and forgiveness. With a new shaft. And um, game changers. I've been, st I like, when I like a club or I like a wedge, I stick with it. Mm. But my clubs got late shipped from Japan. I was going back to Hawaii clubs weren't here they put together a set in the tour department for me and they kind of recommended and game changers i mean i'm hitting them a, a club club and a half further the feel is better so i don't like to switch yeah but i switch to the new and i won't go back to the old it's just it's a little bit better a little bit further um makes the game more enjoyable do you find that's the way you are with putters when like the putter in your bag do you do you find yourself ever going back to like maybe the one in your bag isn't working? Do you go back to an older one or is it like, okay, what's next? What can I do to improve this so that I can get more enjoyment when I'm on the course? So it's weird in my brain. I'm always thinking, how can I do it better? Yep. So the look, the feel, the aiming, the alignment, the finish, the shaft, the shaft and the grip down to the head cover, down to the colors of the paint, the sight dots, the sight lines, so I'm always thinking, so when I do a new line, like the new Phantom, it's a little bit of, um, did I miss anything last year? Did Was it a feel? So I'll go out to the tour, and the guys come here to the studio mm -hmm. and uh, pick their brains. Do you like this? Do you like this? Because a lot of guys can't tell you what they want. 
But if you hand them two things, they'll tell you, I do, I don't. I do, I don't. Do you like the sideline? No. Do you like the finish? It's too shiny. Do you like the grip size? Do you? But they can't tell you what they want until you hand it to them. They'll tell you exactly if they like it or not. So picking the brains of these guys, a lot of that goes into the next line, and it's like, I didn't think of that. So therefore, in the next line is always a way to bring the new stuff that you've heard, felt, and feel into the next line. I feel like it's a really good segue into into Phantom. Mm. Got a new Phantom line coming out. Dude. Phantom has, has been wildly successful. And, you know, I, for me, I, I'm looking at it through the lens of, like, wildly successful on tour. I know a lot of golfers, everyday golfers out there love Phantom putters. But I always find that whenever there's something that's really good, it's like, well, what's next? Mm. Like, how can you How can you make it better? Kind of to your point. So when you're looking at a putter line like Phantom that's had so much success, like what is that first thing when you were saying, well, we need to, let's come up with a new Phantom. Mm -hmm. Like, but let's do these things to try and make it better. What were some of those like top of mind for you that you wanted to improve? Well, when you have a really good something like um, the Justin Thomas, the Phantom 5, mm. um, that all started here with him and his father in here talking about he's a Newport 2 forever and he wanted better alignment. He couldn't see the, the line on the back, so I said, let's do something a little longer. So anyhow, we uh, put together a putter, we cut off a neck, he wanted a plumbing neck, he wanted a little neck. So we just experimented, what do you like? What, do you, what don't you like? Let's look at this. Um, but sometimes when you hit something so good, for example, right now our Newport 2 and our Select line is so good the shape, the face profile, the sole, the soft trisole, the back, the way it flows. Sometimes when you get into, as you said, what do you change? Sometimes the goal is don't screw it up. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, I don't ever want to hand a putter to somebody and said, what the hell is that? Now, that doesn't look like that at all. So sometimes when you get really good at it, because we have putters on our tour side we call masterful and timeless and craftsman. I think those three names are cool because when you get really good at something, whether it's piano or violin or you become, it becomes masterful. Then when designs are really good, doesn't matter when they come, they're timeless. So those names to me mean a lot, masterful and timeless. Um, but the Phantom line, yeah, we have a new one coming and I have a, a new, uh, gentleman that helps me now and I it's always nice to have a great design person with you that can you know you can feed stuff to looks yeah. good looks bad um, he's got a decent resume too he does <laughs> he's been around a while and I've all you know what I've always been a fan even though we are direct competitors for yeah. years he's always a gentleman mm. always a nice guy but I think he was governed from their price point, you know, yeah. make plastic, right. make yeah. make a casting. My goal when I started with Titleist was, I don't care what it cost, I want to make the best. But he he never had that luxury. He was always so. Um, did did Wally kind of when you when you started working with Titleist was was that one of those things the conversation of hey I want to make the best and was Wally on board with like. The best isn't going to come cheap. Like it's it's gonna it's gonna take time. It's gonna take money. It's gonna take like R and D to to get there. Was he on board from the start? I mean, our talk it was really never an interview with yeah. Wally. It was more of a talks, and we hit it off about cars and stuff. And he says, "I want you to do what you do best, and what you don't want to do, let us take care of that." So he was just the absolute master. And he, he said during that talk, when I was joining with him, it took six months for us to come to, I didn't want to do it. Right. But he made it so enticing. Do Why it. didn't you want to do it? I had worked for bigger companies before I set on my little putter company, Scott, Cam Scott Cameron Golf International. Mm -hmm. and I just wanted, I was building putters for other companies without my name, like Ray Cook, like Founders, like Cleveland Classic. 
uh, MaxFly, um, and everybody had you had to keep it under a hundred dollars. And I'm like, just charge more for it. Had to be under a hundred dollars. But you use it more than any other club in your bag. That makes no sense. And also, it can dry for show, putt for dough. Um, so Wally had this. Hey, you do some great stuff. Do what you do best, and let us do the rest. And I may have told you, I thought my com little company hit it big when we got a fax machine because I went international. <laughs> <laughs> so he was the absolute gem of a boss. He told me one time, he goes, uh, let me know if you need me to block and tackle. He says, I want you to stay innovative. I want you to stay on that dotted line, and if you cross over that line, let me know so I can block and tackle for you. I mean, and he said, let the kid dream. Well, I was back then, I was a kid, and I thought, well, why can't you? Um, so I just wanted to build, at the end of the day, I wanted to build cool shit. That's my goal. Yeah. Well, every January, I have a talk with my art people and my uh, staff, and if we won't use it, we won't put it in the market. And I love when I hand a putter to a Jordan or a Justin or a Brad Faxon or whoever, and their eyes light up. Yeah. Because I want that feel, whether it's a car and my eyes light up, or I get a new watch and my eyes light up. Mm. Uh, but golf equipment speaks to you. And when you find the right stuff, that's such a great feel. Yeah. All right, so back to Phantom. What is it about the, the new one when people see it? Like. Mm. They're they're going to say, well, it's, it's Phantom. What's what's new? What is what is that one thing that you would say makes this version different than the previous? A few things in that. Um, Austy Rollinson came from another company, um, my major competitor, the largest putter company at the time until we surpassed that. Mm -hmm. um, and bouncing ideas off him and him off me and taking the best of what he's done and the best of what I've done. There's a certain things in this. We talked about alignment. If you can't align a putter, isn't that all kind of important? Yeah. So in the design, not necessarily in the sight lines, but in the design of the product, without you knowing it, it aims itself. You say, well, what, what how can that be? But when I show you in the product, it's kind of subliminal of the design. Everything, even the shaft bend, aims down your target line. Because I was beating up Austin and some of the shaft bends he did in the past were just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so we beat each other up. Now, so now, now you guys can be honest with each other oh, yeah, since yeah. you're underneath it's one roof. It's awesome. Uh, it's awesome. I, we beat each other up. Like, why would you have done that? That was so stupid. <laughs> but he did some awful shaft bends in the past. And I told him why I like this and why I didn't like that. And um, So it was great working. So this is really the first of having somebody to run things. So, and what a great guy, because his experience of, you know, 30 plus years like mine, um, magical. But you'll see the product, and when I point these things out, you're like, I didn't see that, but that makes perfect sense. There's like four or five different alignment things that we put into the product. So the goal is the Phantom line's been very successful. Don't screw it up. Make it better. And we can point out the things that make it better and why. Sound, feel, performance, alignment, shaft bends, a new grip. Well, how can a grip make a well, big believer in grips? Mm -hmm. When you hold a grip in your hand, it kind of matches the head or it doesn't match the head. Um, because the first thing you feel, you're not feeling the head. You're not feeling the shaft. You're feeling the grip. And the grip starts talking to you on what you expect the head to look like. Mm -hmm. um, great players of the past just talked about how skinny grips worked with softer hands and release. So we have found, and through working in the studio with great players, what grips mean and what it says the head should look like. So I, I love that kind of stuff. We've had some great players. I, I wish I could mention all these names, yeah. great players in. Um, but just to have the time to sit and talk design, 
with these grates and having an access for them to come into the studio and just talk. You know, you can learn so much. Then you come back and, you know, six weeks say, is this what you're talking about? And their eyes light up. Yeah. So finding special things or listening heavily enough to them and coming back with something, working together and getting ideas and confidence on products they want to use. Yeah. When you are talking to tour pros, are you, are you, are they mostly just coming here to have those conversations? Are you going out on tour? Um, so every, like, every way. Okay. Um, for example, I'll go out to seven tour events a year, and I always <laughs> like the great ones like Hawaii. I was going to say the, the Masters. Ones, yeah. <laughs> but I have a great... I have You're like, not going to John Deere, Scotty? <laughs> <laughs> Tri-Cities. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, I used to. I know you did, yeah. but now, now you get to pick your schedule exactly. a bit more. Yeah. Exactly. But as I get older, I've just turned 61... You know, these younger touring pros uh, want to kind of chat with more of what younger guys that they can. But when they get in here, I always give the courtesy of going down, checking on them. What can I do to help? And um, I learned so much from these guys, even the young guys. Um, so the generations that I've, you know, I've been working with the Arnold Palmers of the world, then you had your other the Marco Mears of the world, then you have your younger Justin Thomas, Jordan Speed of the world. Now we're getting into the next phase of these young kids. So, over, you know, I'm approaching 40 years in the golf business. That, that actually brings up an, an interesting question, which is how has your time working with tour pros changed over the over the years, over the decades. Mm -hmm. um, like what were working with those guys when you started early on, like what were they looking for in a putter versus like today's touring pros that have, you know, launch monitors and, and motion capture? Like how has that changed and how has that kind of forced you to evolve? Right, right. So way back, um, you didn't have all the tools, you know, at the, couldn't afford CNC, computer numerical controlled machines and milling machines. So a lot of putters were castings or forged. Um, working with some of the greats, you know, you had forged items, you know, um, Tommy Armor, IMG 5s, and you had uh, Wilson 8802s, great heel shafted putters uh, that felt soft. But then when you got into the later periods of castings, they were very hard. So when you would talk to, say, uh, Arnold Palmer, what was soft to him versus a David Duvall years later, um, he liked more of a, with a, I'm not going to use a company name because I shouldn't, but they had a slot in the bottom of the putter yeah. and it made a sound like ping. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and it was a different sound. So a David Duvall and a Justin Leonard would talk about the sound a lot. They called that soft. Well, the era prior to them, or a couple, they called something else soft. So you're trying to pick the brain of the touring pro. What do you want to hear? Mm -hmm. So then you start working on these sounds and speed slots and trillium inserts to hit sound. Then people come along with hard golf balls, and you're like, what? That just threw a whole monkey wrench in there of tuning putters around what they want to hear. Then you put a different golf ball in, and that changes everything. So you're trying to stay up on things on golf balls because it's sound uh, changes, but of what the player wants. So if you ask, you know, an era of a Arnold Palmer versus a David Duvall versus a Jordan Spieth. Sound and feel are different depending on what they grew up with. That's a really good point. So it, I'm thinking I'm thinking Phantom and how the guys that have their current ones, did they give you any sort of feedback? Going back to just the feedback you have the tour pros, what kind of feedback did they give you during the during the design process? Anything they sure. wanted to see? I mean, you, you talk about the alignment, which I think is so fascinating because not a lot of golfers really consider that. They're always looking at like, what does the putter look like? How does it how does it does it sole correctly? But what was what kind of feedback were they yeah. giving you during that design process? For example, um, 
face height um, and the way that looks to their eye. Mm -hmm. And I've found, I had this thought, and I, but having it confirmed is kind of eye-opening. I had a player in, he said, Scotty, your Newports and Newport 2s, the face have been getting taller. I said, they have been. I've gone to a little high toe. Right. He said, it's gotten to a point, this player said, where it gets so tall, in order for me to hit the center of the putter, I feel like I have to forward press it. Okay. If the face is too shallow, I feel like I hit the top of the face, so I have to come up on it. So the way the putter looks, face height, it makes me do different things. Just like if you were to look at a driver and it was dead hook-faced. In order for you to hit it, that thing's telling you you've got to change in order to get it opened. Or vice versa. The face hits dead open. You manipulate because you're an athlete, and mm. you will enough be able to close that face. Somehow you will. But I don't want you to have to manipulate on a stroke. So alignment, this new phantom, um, and I'll point them out of these features of alignment, but it's part of the design. And yes, the other thing, we just don't have lines. We have some with dots, we have some with lines, and we have one with an arrow. But I didn't want, I love the arrow. I didn't want to put it all on everything because if you don't like the arrow, then you're not going to buy anything. So I wanted something for everybody, but this arrow is quite cool. And it's not that distracting. It helps, but if you don't like the arrow, then we have lines. Yeah. So just learning from guys from tour on those little things like confirming face height. Now we can test and tell you what works best but it's funny how these touring pros first look at what they see and what they like because if they don't like the look of a putter they're not going to use it yeah so i always loved how you you take ideas from outside of the industry mm -hmm. whether it's automotive or, or wherever you find inspiration and you put it into your putters is there anything in this new phantom that you took inspiration from outside the industry, something you saw or something that looked cool to you that you decided to, mm -hmm. to put into put in this one? <laughs> As we've talked about grips, um, uh, grips speak to you. Mm -hmm. um, I like bicycles, Schwinn bicycles. I, I grew up with it. I live at the beach and I like cruisers and I like Schwinn bicycles. That's just one of those weird things I like. Um, and I found a set of handlebars that had some grips, and you'll remember the name, Huffy. It was kind of a low end. Oh, I had a Huffy when I was a kid. It was a low. <laughs> oh, it was yeah. like, if you drove up on a Schwinn, you were like driving a Ferrari. Mm. If you drove up on a Huffy, it was like driving a Yugo yep. or a Pinto. <laughs> so I found a set of grips, uh, and they were fast. And on this new Phantom line, I wanted everything looking fast. Um, when it's standing still, it looks like it's going 90 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So the angles, which help the alignment, also make it look fast. But the grip had never been done before, and it came from a set of huffy bicycle grips. And there's angles. So I'm looking at this. Why does it look so fast? And the angles... For example, that doesn't look fast. Yeah. That looks fast. So when you look at the top of the grips there, the top of the grip is at the same angle as the floor. So normally a grip is straight. This is angled. So when you're at a proper lie angle, that's flat to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I have the collar flat to the ground. I wanted that to look fast as the product looks fast. Um, and that had never been done before. And we came with a new grip shape where a lot of the guys in the past, Andy Beans and Lanny Watkins and Tom Kites and great golfers loved a grip and it was larger in the right hand. And the USGA made it uh, taper 
you couldn't taper, you couldn't have a waist to a grip. So anyhow, learning from the past of what was there, uh, Golf Pride made a great grip, and it was, um, but we went to the past and brought out some of the new thoughts and created a new grip, even from its shape. And we're working on this grip, and we wanted texture because we found when it's too smooth and it gets wet or rainy or dewy, mm. um, we needed some texture to suck up some of that moisture or water. So the grip, instead of having dots in the back or uh, cross lines or little markings, car guy, Audi has a fast-looking station wagon, RS6 Avant. And their grills and in their interior, they use this kind of shape. So I modified that shape because it looked fast, mm. like the grip looked fast, like the head looks fast, and thought, let's do do something not conventional but something out of the box so nicknamed it looks like a chain link fence but faster um, and the grip I put it on um, a gal's putter and she says there's less voids I'm touching my hands are touching more of the grip compared to other grips there's voids in there so full contact is the other name that we use in marketing. Full contact, um, just the grip feels better in the hand. So you, the first thing you touch on the club is the grip. Yeah. So that's got to speak to you. And then you look down the shaft, and I always take off the steps. I want the same step pattern, but no steps. I want the performance of the shaft, and we've spent a lot of time on shafts, but I want it clean. Even down at the bottom of the grip, I don't have any paint for my eye to get stuck. I don't have a shaft band because I put it on the back the long ways because I don't want my eye getting stuck. It goes all the way down into the bend of these new phantom mallets. And if you look down and say, where is that bending? It's pointing at the hole. If you look at others, they kind of go S bends and all this, and they're going all over the place. Well, let's not complicate things. Let's make things simple. And you're aiming at the hole, so why don't you have things help you align that or aim that at the hole? So there's a lot that went into the new Phantom of, first off, don't screw it up. How do we make it better and how can we make it sound better, look better, align better, perform better, and feel better in the hands also uh, with the grip? A lot went into this, but it's been great working with Austi and using his knowledge of the past and of the future it's been great to have him. These, I would say, look meaner than okay. the last one. They're angles. Yeah. For example. But I think that maybe that's why. It just, it, it's got, it's got a little bit, feels like a little bit more of an edge to it. If you look at a lot of Mercedes and, and cars and you look at the headlights, BMWs, they're squinty. Mm -hmm. They almost look like they have a meanness or a character to the headlights coming at you. You are correct. These have an attitude. Uh, kind of badass. Yeah. Uh, angry. Um, smoky. Dark. Um, kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want you to compare your passion for putter design when you first came into the industry to where it is now. Mm. Well, I love the classics. My father is a classic club guy. I started looking at classics at... Uh, 8802, Arnold Palmer Design Buys. Um, I love classics. My favorite putter to work on is, I call them Craftsman, and they're flangey blades, and I get heel and toe weight out of putting in a, um, a bullet bottom sole, which looks like you shot a, a bullet and it, it took some weight out of the bottom. Some call it a catamaran sole came from a set of Wilson 1969 Wilson staff irons and they call them bullet bullet backs so I did a bullet bottom so I can remove weight instead of having a visual of a pocket in the back I can put the pocket underneath at the bullet bottom sole and I can shape pintails square backs coronado round backs and by shaping those it adds character so I love, of the past, classics. For example, you do a Newport 2. 
I think we make a if not the best in the marketplace. And that that came from a company that I really enjoy watching over time. The Newport 2 mm. started off as something. And they've done a heck of a job in the years past, but some of the materials they used didn't sound too good. Some of the shapes got tired. My goal was to take something very good and make it great. And the Newport 2, if you're going to make a Newport 2, make it look like that. Don't change it so much where the player's going to come back and say, oh, you messed it up. So I'm very protective of don't mess it up, but make it better. Yeah. You know, I feel like we all struggle with this days where we're just not feeling creative. But I want to know, how do you get the creative juices flowing on days when you're, when you're not feeling it, when you mm -hmm. walk in here and maybe you're not feeling as creative as, as other days? I am get inspired by a lot of things. Um, for example, when I struggle, I can't feel like I'm into shaft bands. Mm -hmm. I'm into head covers, but I think things make you think, you know, fast or slow or, or classic or elegant or craftsman looking, timeless. Um, if I'm looking for a font for a head cover, if I'm looking for a font for a sole plate, <laughs> I'm fascinated by wine bottles and their labels. And I'll walk down. What hits me? Why do I stop at it? Why do I look at it? Is it the color? Is it the shape? Is it a character? Is it a font? I'll get inspired by wine bottles. I'm also a bit intrigued by um, cigar labels, mm -hmm. rings. How much work goes into some of the graphics on wine bottles and cigar bands and I always look at that why would I stop to look at that and what catches my eye so inspiration from cars um, inspiration from a wine label um, and for example we talked about the grip and the bicycle the huffy bicycle grips being angled to make it look faster um, Schwinn bicycles they had I had a candy apple red Schwinn as a kid. That red look is what I want in the cherry bombs in my putters. Mm -hmm. It's a translucent candy apple. If you just put red paint in there, not cool at all. But if you use this translucent lacquer red paint that looks like a candy apple, that just is cool. Yeah. So things that excite me, I found that some of my friends and followers, um, it excites them also. So I am constantly looking at shapes and I'll be at lunch and I'll see something, I'll take a picture and people are like, what are you taking a picture of that for? I, I see a font there I want to use. Mm. Um, so it's everywhere. I'll take a picture. So when I am suffering, when I am having that writer's block, I can go through the phone. I want to pull that one in. And I also have an art department where I can actually pull up my phone and share these thoughts and text everybody in my art department. Hey, that new girl, my girl we're walking, working on for next year, look at this font because it says the character of the my girl that we're using. This font says what I'm trying to explain. I think I worked with one of the greats in the golf industry, um, Barry Grimes was an art guy, and he was a right-hand art guy for John Ashworth. Back in the day, you remember some of the ads they did. Would, they'd be in like a big boat cat, Cadillac or a Pontiac, with the top down. You had Jim Nance, you had Freddie Couples, you had John Cook, uh, you had John Ashworth, all super cool guys. But um, that was all thought of the brain of Barry Grimes, who passed away last two years ago. I spent a lot of time with him, and he taught me about fonts and how they speak to you. So, uh, in the every head cover that we've done, I have a absolute. I love those because they excite me. Yeah. But fonts, I was taught by Barry Grimes, and using fonts to say what you're feeling. For you, what's more enjoyable, getting into the weeds during the creation process or seeing a lot of those ideas bring a product to life at the 
at the finish line. I love to see products come to life. I'm a product guy. And there's so much thought. And I'm so proud to go to a PGA show because I've been working on that baby for a couple of years and finally showing the world this baby I've created. Um, so people talk about trade shows and being tough to go to. And I always was so excited to go to a trade show because I wanted to sh show. Um, you know, whether it was 35 years ago when I was making putters then versus on a Monday I come into work and I'm as excited because things are changing. Um, golf is changing, but especially putters. You know, I've gone through the era of the long putter, of the belly putter, of the anchored putter, of different styles, and the USGA governs what we can or cannot do. And we Titleist, Scotty Cameron, we follow the guidelines of the USGA, though we try to walk on that fine line of taking things to the extreme, but never crossing the line. But I think it's our job as a design group to design things that are, stay on that, that leading edge. So I want you to, to tell a couple of origin stories because there are um, iconic aspects of your putters from over the years. People see it and they just assume like, oh, Scotty just kind of came up with this on the fly. And the first one is cherry bombs. Where, what's the origin story there? Where, where did that come from? Sure. There are a few that made me go to it because it's that story of why does my eye go to it? For example, started off when I was young, 9-10, my father would take me to Orange County International Raceway, which is a drag strip, mm -hmm. and um, would be sitting in the stands, and he loved cars, and I loved cars, and he got me into that, and we'd be sitting there watching the races, and a car would come to get on the track. And when you'd cut a hole, and you'd have, whether it was a blower or something coming out of the hood, there are three red dots of the, the call them butterflies for the carburation, for the carburation to, to breathe. And when they'd gas it, boom, these butterflies would move and they were actually aluminum and they're anodized red. So it had that translucent look. So three red dots coming out of the hood. I knew it was going to be fast and knew it was going to be exciting. Years later, my wife wanted to have a new 35 millimeter camera. And a friend of mine said, hey, this is a great one here. Um, I think the Leica was the name of the brand. Yeah. And they had Carl Zeiss lenses, which mm -hmm. were the best lenses. And so Leica. So I went out hunting for a Christmas gift for my wife and going to all these camera shops. And whenever I'd go in, I'd look for their logo was a red dot from Leica. So when I was starting to do some new ports, uh, when they were silver, they started looking like another brand's putter. So um, I was putting these cherry dots on the back so when they get on tour, you could notice a silver putter with red dots would be a Cameron, just like the Leica putter and just like the race car. When I saw red dots, they were exciting. Yeah, and a couple, a couple of putters that are used by a few legends of the game. Those, those are the ones that everybody notices. It's like they see the, the see the cherry bomb, and it's like that's a Scotty. Kind of similar, like you're talking about, like going into a camera store and looking for a Leica and seeing seeing that red dot. It's it's just become synonymous with with your brand. So I read sometimes I read some of the when I bring out a new product what are they saying about it you know on our website yeah. and sometimes they talk about I'm so sick of those red dots and, and believe me I do I am also but I'll go to the marketing group of titles and say hey I'm looking to take off those red dots They're like no don't go there <laughs> we love the red dots yeah, yeah, yeah. so I always like in the back of the pockets of Newport's Newport 2's or the select super select I want movement in the back of those putters. I want um, industrial mechanical with elegance, and I want movement of milling, and I want mill marks. So in the back there, I don't have any red cherry stuff right now mm. in the back of those, but I have some bombs in the back because um, it's boring in the back of a putter. 
but how can I use those to make it stronger, sound better, more vibration dampening? So I'll use the back of the putter to speak, but also to feel. Yeah. All right. So we go from cherry bombs to circle T. <laughs> This is a this is a great story. Oh, I love it, but I but I want you to tell like there's there was a reason why you had to start adding the circle T to boxes. You're correct, um, and it's weird how things happen and they evolve. So mm. hopefully I don't bore you. On a long story short, um, when I was in Orange County and there was a great uh, steakhouse called Black Angus. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. As a steakhouse and uh, commercial and they're promoting their steaks and at the end kind of the quality would come down and a uh, cattle prod would come on the steak and sear this kind of western looking cattle prod in the steak and burn it in there. And um, so I'm making putters and about four o'clock every afternoon I had to ship. I had to have everything in the box. I had to check the grip, had to check this, had to make that, put them in the box. And I had a rep on the LPGA tour and a, I had a rep on the PGA tour and that's in the box. Well, I mixed the boxes up and the one PGA tour went to the ladies. So not a big deal. They sent them back and I swapped them and sent them out. But So that didn't happen again. It was going into the box for the PJ Tour um, on my head covers, which back in the day nobody really put on head covers. But I put a T and I circled the T um, and it looked like a cattle prod in my mind because I didn't finish the circle. I just ended the circle. And the thought was to mark it like that steak. Um, so I put a circle T on it and I knew on that head cover it went into this box and made it to the tour. Mm -hmm. And the ladies didn't have the circle T because I was going to the tour. Um, and the ladies didn't have it. So I, I could tell if it had it, it's going to the tour. If it didn't have it, it's going to the LPGA tour. Um, so sent them out, and my tour rep at the time said, "Hey, players are asking, what does this T thing mean?" And I said, "Well, that just I know that that putter goes into the tour box for the PGA tour, so don't mix them up to the different tours." So why are you asking that? He goes, well, players are wanting it. So why? So the next week, he calls and he says, hey, two young kids walked up to my, my uh, staff bag full of putters, and they took a couple of head covers and ran out. Something's desirable about those circle T's. So instead of me every time marking it on, I thought, well, the head cover manufacturer, I'll do some artwork, send it to them, and they can embroider the circle T on there. Mm -hmm. So some say it stood for Tour Cameron, because it wasn't really a circle, or a Circle T. So why, why do they want that? I just make sure it gets in the right bag. So the Circle T was out of necessity, and it came from the branding from the steak from the Black Angus restaurant. That's how that happened. I mean, would you, would you, is it fair to say that the Circle T is, is the one that, that you, when people see it, like they know? That it's a it's a Scotty Cameron out of all. I mean, you've had so many. We were talking about Jackpot Johnny, Hothead Harry. I mean, there's so many. But but I would is it fair to say Circle T is probably the one that that people know the most. Like, by far, yeah, by far. Because yeah. I think he inspired to have a Circle T and the Circle T. Um, oh, it is it is aspirational. I mean, everybody everybody wants everybody wants a Circle T. Yeah, it's like that's that's all. It's like a status symbol almost. You know, the most famous player to ever use a Cameron putter and I would love to say his name because he's a friend of mine and I love him yeah. but because of corporations and yeah, business yeah, I yeah. can't say his yeah. name um, but what's so funny is popular as that putter is for him and for us right it doesn't have a circle T yeah no you're right which is weird because you would think it would but it doesn't yeah I, I mean I do I know that you've got like you can't say his name 97 Masters is the one that comes to mind. I think people people know exactly who we're talking about here. But that that sort of felt like a turning point for 
for you, for you, for Scotty Cameron? Well, the first turning point was Bernhard Langer in 93. Yeah, that, that was, was huge. That was huge. For me. For you. Was, which was bigger? Because that's 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 something that I've always wanted to know. Which was, which was the bigger one for you, 93 with Langer or 97? Probably 97. Yeah. <laughs> but 93, Bernhard put Cameron on the map. Right. No doubt about it. Yeah. Um, but what was so unique about the 97 um, were those white dots. There's a cool story behind those, too. Yeah. <laughs> Man, we could just tell I'm origin stories. Bore you to death. We could tell origin stories all day. But now, Scotty, this is something that you and I talked about before, before we started, before I hit record. But I think what I love most about your putters is that there are so many neat stories behind them. And it's not just you sitting in, in a studio, just like doing something like there, there's a real story. So what's, what is the story behind the dots? Sure. Okay. Sorry to bore you on this one. Um, I can promise you nobody listening to this podcast is bored right now. <laughs> so Wally Uline, my boss, greatest guy in the golf industry and one of the greatest gentlemen I've ever met. Um, he said the golf ball is changing. It's getting harder. And this is back in 97. They're going from ballada mm -hmm. to harder stuff. And uh, he says, how are you going to combat that with your, your putters? And now it gets the mind thinking. And um, gosh, this is just a crazy story. So I'm working on one of my cars. And I broke your muffler, hangs off of your suspension with a rubber bracket. And that bracket broke, and I thought, well, rubber, I can do better than this. Let's just weld a piece of metal in there where it makes it more firm and would never break again from being rubber. Right. So I uh, put this uh, hanger of the muffler and uh, did it out of steel. Done, cleaned up, started the car, and it shook the inside of the car like no tomorrow. It was just vibration and, and uh, running it through the whole car, and I thought, ooh. That rubber is an insulator between to not vibrate the car. So rubber got into my mind. So I had met with a bunch of different glue type companies to glue in an insert. Because Wally had said, hey, how are you going to combat? I thought I was going to put an insert in there. How can I affect the sound and feel of the golf ball at impact? So I had, I, what's the softest material I could make? But I didn't want to use plastic or inserts in a putter. I wanted things that wouldn't fail in the world. For example, if you put plastic and that plastic goes into an airplane and it's, call it uh, 29 degrees. Mm -hmm. And you go to Palm Springs for Bob Hope and you put it in your trunk and it's 170 degrees in your trunk. Then you go back to the airport so you got 30 degrees to 170 degrees. Plastics get brittle and plastics crack. So I didn't want to use that. I wanted to use a material. Softest material I could find was something called, and there's an, another story here, um, tellurium. Tellurium is the name of the softest copper. And I've never heard of tellurium, but at the time, a company was doing a lot of beryllium. Beryllium copper, beryllium nickel. But I had found that beryllium was really hard. So this tellurium. So I wanted to use something beryllium, but tellurium was softer, so I used tellurium and called it terillium. Mm -hmm. So that's how the terillium. But I backed that up with this... Um, the dots in the back when I was milling this, I didn't want to have a big pocket in the back and, and filling it full of goop. So I milled in, I told in the insert, I had four screws on the outside, but I didn't want to see the screws, so I embedded the screws and put this white, um, it looked like glue, over. When I was making that putter at the time, I was 36 years old, and I designed 36 dots in the back for 36 years old. So I did 36 dots, but four of those dots I embedded deeper so I could hide the screws that held in the insert. So I went to different glue companies and manufacturers like 3M. I was looking for something vibration dampening, but you could poke a T in and it wouldn't rip it. 
So I worked with Daubert Chemical. I worked with different chemical companies trying to come up with a vibration dampening membrane that wouldn't poke, pop, or fall out. And um, one Sunday I'm watching golf and it hit me. So I'm trying to create from the car something rubber learning from the vibration of the car into the vibration of the impact of a golf ball mm. and um hit me and my daughter was like four and i put her in the car and we went to target and went into their home goods department and went to silicone and silicone they had nine different types of different colors and different types and whether it was a bathroom tub water caulking or a window caulking or a caulking of glue so I bought nine types and I went back to my garage where my workshop was and I milled nine holes into a piece of aluminum and I marked them A B C D each one so when I marked the tubes of the caulking and I squeezed it in with my glue gun with my caulking gun and came back then and I squeegeed it off that. So I had nine dots of silicone marked and I marked the tubes. Took a T, poke, 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 poke. And the one that I wanted that wouldn't rip, wouldn't puncture, but I could feel the pressure mm -hmm. with a T uh, was a tub and tile window caulking also. Universal caulking that added a rubber... And that became the back of the trillium putter. And it is what we called it, but it's a vibration dampening membrane. Is tub, tile, and window caulking with 32 dots. And all that was was to make it softer feel. Right. I'm experimenting with this, and it, it makes sense, and it actually affected the sound and feel because those holes went right in the back of the trillium insert. It didn't stop at the back wall. I injected that all the way into the insert. What you may not have known is in the back wall there, when I would actually embed that uh, silicone in the back, if it had a pocket, I couldn't squeegee that out of the pocket. It would get stuck. So Terillium putters never had a pocket, it just had a back wall, so I could squeegee that up and not get it stuck into the pocket. So I'm working on this and, and this great I can just picture you doing doing all this like <laughs> I'm in my garage doing this. And it's tub and tile caulking. And I don't care what it is, can it affect the sound and feel? And is it is it going to do what I expect my mind to do? soften the vibration and damping off the putter face on a harder golf ball. So I'm having players come in. Some of the greats are coming in. I'm explaining this, and they're like, either he's a whack job or... I was about to say, they, they might be giving you some weird looks. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I had this one with all the dots, and this great player comes in. He goes, what's this? And he goes, that makes perfect sense. Let me try it, and takes it out, and don't really know what happened, and he... Uh, has it a few weeks as it's awesome yeah he puts it in play and damned if he doesn't win the 97 masters with this tellarium being terillium set in with four screws with this silicone for bathtub tile and window caulking with a vibration dampening membrane which is rubber that learned from the car he wins with this, and people nicknamed it the Domino Putter because it did. Oh, yeah, for and sure. And it was unbelievable during that Masters how many camera views you had at the back of this putter. It was that in time, place, and it just hit. Yeah. And putters went crazy. Was it overwhelming in in the aftermath for you with all with all the demand that you were that you were getting? I mean, we we talk about comparing longer to call him the goat. Sure. Sure. Was 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 it was it a little overwhelming just with, with all the demand that I'm sure that you were that you were getting for your putters I'm after that win? Fan. I'm a huge fan of manufacturing and it, it's, I have always when I go into my factory or my milling factory or embroidery factory, sound. Um, 
and I love to hear machines running because when machines are running, mm -hmm. you're making money. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say making money, you're in business. Right. For when sure. it's quiet and machines aren't running, you're going to go out of business. Yeah. So it was always a great motivator for having machines run. Um, but I do remember learning about we could take the, the tubes and the guns of caulking, which we started injecting, and we went to five-gallon drums. And I remember we hired in this warehouse that we have, we had 17 girls with five, and we had injectors, and they had a foot, and they could inject it with a 36 times. Oh, my God. 17 girls, all these dots, and yeah. the manufacturer. So I love manufacturing of how do we get this done, mm -hmm. the cleanest way, the most efficient, yeah. the cost effective. And that was just an awesome time for me. We redid that putter um, 22 years later. And I was amazed when we redid that Terillium putter. Uh, how many touring pros grew up wanting that putter that couldn't afford that putter that actually now on tour they couldn't use it but they still wanted it and we gave it to these guys because of the awe that was created not only at that time by a great product but a, one of the greatest players ever. Now, I've seen some some putter brands uh, I'm thinking more kind of bespoke that have started to pop up in the last few years um, and I, I would say they certainly, it feels like they're trying to emulate something that you've made very successful, you know, brands built around like a person versus just a name. And, and I wonder because it, they are emulating Scotty, does that, does that flatter you? Does it motivate you to keep your foot on the pedal? Like how, like where, how do you feel about that? You know, if it's done respectfully and um, there's no one coming out and eating um, had mentioned about Scotty Cameron, you know, one of the great putter makers of all time. So mm -hmm. I gain respect. It's the ones that kind of knock you off and don't give you kudos. Yep. For example, have I borrowed a hundred percent? Who doesn't? Mm -hmm. Um, but then to give kudos to that company or that person, now that's the pat on the back. Um, through patents. Um, most design patents are 14 years, whether it's a utility patent, like inside of a metal wood and you have a honeycomb, mm. that would be a utility patent, but a design patent when you can see it. So there's different patents in different years. But after certain years, that patent is now expired and anybody can do it. So ethics of when you're going to emulate something, just make sure that uh, legally, um, it's proper, but if you're going to borrow, at least give credit to the credits due. So to answer your question, it all depends on the way it's done. Mm -hmm. If it's done with class, I really enjoy it. If it's done um, not the right way, kind of bugs me. Yeah. So as we record this pod, we're, we're here at the, the Scotty Cameron Putter Studio. You have a, a more of a consumer facing, which is the gallery in Encinitas. And in Japan. And in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. Um, and, and those, I mean, you could you could walk up if you wanted to. If you were you were here in the San Diego area, you could make the drive up to Encinitas and and you know take a look at all the incredible creations there. But this studio is really special because this is where the pros come. This is where you spend a lot of your time. Um, but I want to know what what about this studio do you feel like gives you an edge over your competition? Well, the studio was created because of I wanted to see what happened between the player, the putter, and the golf ball. Because the way you use a putter or I use a putter is different. It's very personal. So where do you play the ball in the back of the stance or the front of the stance? Do you have a pop stroke? For me to design the best player, the best putters for the best players, best amateurs, what do you do with my putter? And how can I help you with my putter make balls go in the hole? So I now call it the art of putting, which is the, the player affects the putter, and the putter affects the golf ball. 
Let's go backwards. The ball's affected by the putter, and the putter's affected by the player. So if you have a forward press, so we have found that through high-speed video, which the gallery, I'm sorry, the studio was set up as, what happens? Why does it happen? So being with a great company of Titleist, my boss, Wally Uline, I said in order to me, for me to make the best putters for the vet, I need to know what they do. And I need to capture that high-speed video. I need to know what the ball's doing off the putter. He, when he saw Promise, he would help fund these things. And I wanted, so I worked with different companies to try, in my mind, I wanted to see what the ball did versus the putter, then back up and see the player with the putter and the golf ball. Earth shattering. So I brought Wally in, and after I developed this kind of half assed camera system, I started my garage. And originally, Scotty's garage ended up being the putter studio. Um, but we started in the garage and we had a warehouse, and it became the putter studio. Wally's lefty hit three putts, and he looked back and goes, Do we have a patent on this? I said, not yet. He goes, before you show anybody else, please get a patent. So we have nine patents on this apparatus of how many uh, uh, the camera frames per second and overhead and back view. And it was just so good. So I remember asking players to come in, the greats at the time. And I remember David Duvall was having a tough time, and Wally, he was with Titles, and Wally said, hey, you got to go see Scotty. He's working on something, and he thinks, I, it can enlighten what you see. Mm -hmm. So David Duvall comes in, not not really, says, Wally said, I should be here. What do you want to do? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, let me just show you what I'm up to. And he gets on there, and I said, well, this is what happens to the ball. This is what we expect, but you may affect it, and your putter may not be perfect, and blah, blah, blah. He hits three putts and he looks back and goes, I'm not half as screwed up as I thought I was. Meaning, he thought he did different things. He didn't know until you could slow it down and show him. And um, we worked on a few things and he's, he's just a talent, you know. He saw where it went wrong and he could fix it. And some of the greats that we've worked with are that quick. Guys and girls that uh, they're just athletes. We've worked with some amateurs that aren't very good, and they can't make the fix. But true athletes and great players can. So, um, anyhow, the studio here is a place that I found that I can learn. And I worked with these great camera companies, and there's Dave Phillips is a friend of mine from TPI. And um, he was a camera guy working with another company at that time. So Dave, I want to look at this and blah, blah, blah. And he says, well, I can't help you with that because that's high speed. I can work with this, 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 but yeah, I have a guy. He says, this guy, um, he sold his company, but he works um, on programming, and he did a phone system, and he sold it for a gazillion dollars. So when you have an area code, it transfers here, it transfers this, and he does this. He goes, I think that's a guy you need. Let me give him a call. So I get the access, I call this guy, and uh, I said, I'm working on the system, I need for this to show this, and I want to see impact of a putter versus a player. Mm -hmm. Player affects a putter, putter affects a ball. He goes, got it. So I've been working eight, nine a year on this project, because I need to see it to know what to make for the great players. Nobody could figure this out, the timing when you take it back and impact and capture at impact. This is how crazy. This guy had such a mind um, from this programming, of programming this, of what I wanted. I've been working on this a year. This guy comes into my warehouse, in my garage actually, and says, give me a half hour. And I'm thinking, you're out of your mind. I come back in 45 minutes, and what I wanted and trying to work on for a year, this guy did in a half hour. Wow. <coughs> Ingenious. And I uh, basically, we spent the day together working on blah, 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 got it, fine-tuned, fine-tuned. I said, what do I owe you? 
I had the thought, I had the dream of high speed. I needed to see it so I could make putters for mm. the best. He was this crazy engineer of programming. I said, what do I owe you? He says, one putter and a set of golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Done. <laughs> so Dave Phillips turned me on to this gentleman. Dave is a... Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Dave. <laughs> Dave's a great genius in this kind of stuff, but it was out of his field, and he knew he could pass it. He opened up a door, and um, that's how that began. But we still have this studio. I wanted the best to come and understand it, but it was so cool. I wanted amateurs to have that same experience, thus opening the studio in Encinitas, California, and outside of Tokyo and Hamamatsu, where the best amateurs, or any amateurs, if you want to get fit, I think it has to be done through high-speed video. And when you get fit and it doesn't show the body, you should question it. If it's just a computer screen showing your putter and golf ball, well, that is all affected by you, the player, and your alignment and your shoulders. And so I think it's three. It's the ball, putter, and person coming together to create the art of putting. Over the years since you've had this studio, who's, who's the one pro who spent the most time here? Brad Faxon. I love that. I love that answer because he, I feel like your, your relationship with him is like so intertwined that, that fax day putter that he has. Um, what is it about, about Brad that, that like inspires you like from your time having worked with him? What, what does he bring that inspires you when it comes to designing putters? Well, Brad was one of the best putters on the PGA Tour when he played. Um, great putter. If he couldn't putt, he wouldn't have been on the PGA Tour. Because <laughs> <laughs> he hit it a little sideways with a driver. But he could putt like there was no other. So I was intrigued with him because he was really good. Mm -hmm. I remember I was at a Tournament of Champions at La Costa Resort, and I was young. And I walked up to him and introduced myself and um, he had, I had a putter he kind of liked, and he put his putter to the side on his hip. And he's putting like a 15-footer. And he had like six balls. He was just practicing. And he took my putter, set his on his hip, took my putter, and he made every single putt. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but his stats were he wasn't the best. He, he has all this down. And it's intriguing to me because he was like 19th in the world in putting. And he has that curious mind of he's known as a good putter. He can always get better. So I worked with him. The putter he used, carbon steel, we made a putter together. He put it in play. But the key was the fitting system of high-speed video intrigue the heck out of him because he never was able to what he did can i see it because mm -hmm. we have the high speed video and on a normal recorder you couldn't see this because i happened too fast so his stats go from like 19 to number one and to this day he'll say it was such an enlightening experience to see what i do versus my putter versus the ball that my my mind understood it more that I could trust that I was on track or off track. So he's such an, he just wants to know more, but was so funny over the years that great player we keep talking about mm -hmm. when he would come in, Hey, can I see the footage of Brad Faxon? That's interesting. So he wanted, he wanted to see footage of, of other great putters. No, a Brad, just a Brad. I don't know why. But then well, Brad, Brad was, was a great putter. So Brad would always yeah. ask, what is this gentleman working on? Mm -hmm. And I would share a little information of, and those two would always compare notes about mm -hmm. each other. And I found that very, very strange because they had such high, um, 
they thought so highly of one another's putting stats and putting styles and so on. But if you look at the great and his posture and a lot of things that he does, looks like Brad Faxon. Yeah, interesting. Um, so if you weren't creating putters, what would you be doing? Designing furniture. Really? Yeah. See, I would have totally thought you'd have been in like wanting to be a mechanic or, Me or working for one of the one of the like Mercedes or really? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Um, I love chairs. I love Charles and Ray Ames. Great design of chairs, and I make furniture for myself. But what was intriguing to me when we wait, you make furniture for yourself? I do. For example, when you go into my gallery in Encinitas, mm -hmm. and all of the I-beams and the glass shelving right. made that in the putter studio. Really? All of that was industrial mechanical mm -hmm. with elegance, recycled I-beams from large construction jobs. I love furniture, and I'm not a wood guy. I'm a metal guy. Um, I love furniture... And to stand back in the form and function of how it lays back or or how the arms come up or um, I don't know why that is I collect chairs and in my in my galleries you'll notice chairs all over the place from chairs that I've either made or inspired um, chairs and furniture and when I did the gallery in Encinitas I just wanted it to be manly, industrial, and couldn't have green fake carpet and crossed golf clubs it set inside of a crest. It had to be cement, metal, elegance, and glass. The doors you open to get into the putting studio in my gallery in Encinitas, each door weighs 300 pounds. Created the doors, created the walls, Bought the glass man With all this free time you have, Scotty. <laughs> but I had three guys back in the putter studio that got my vision of these shelvings, yeah. of these I-beams, of these large bolts and welded. And we did this as a team effort in my putter studio of guys to just get my crazy sense of humor and vision to create cool shit. I feel like we probably already talked about it, so I, I may know the answer, but I'm I am curious. Weirdest place you found motivation for a design aspect or component on a putter? You know, I get it from everything, but yeah, that the silicone is so far fetched. Mm -hmm. And working with uh, chemical companies to create what I envision in my brain, and it just turned out. So I was in Target with my daughter, and she's four, and I've got nine tubes of this. Um, working with chemical companies I couldn't get what I had in my mind that I was trying to create and it just happened so that's it's got to be well one that's kind of crazy crazier than that from in my mind mm. I was working too much forgive me long-winded story I'll cut it short um, whenever this great person putter would come into town whether he didn't have time to come by, he something would happen to his putter when he's in town. And he would always call to see if I would help. Yeah. Or jump. When he asked, I jump. And today, when he asked, I jump. Yeah. And uh, long story short, my wife's getting upset. We have a, a four-year-old daughter. Uh, we had tickets to go to the Harlem Globetrotters downtown San Diego. We had tickets. I get the call. I watch this happen on TV, San Diego. He uh, missed a putt and hit the bottom of his bag. Right. And I said, ooh, that's going to affect. Mm -hmm. So I told, I was having lunch, and I said, uh, to one of my uh, people, I said, we're going to get a call. <laughs> You're going to have to jump, Scotty. <laughs> two hours later, I had a bad speaker system in the warehouse, and I'm grinding on some putters, mm -hmm. and I pick up the phone. I knew it was him. Mm -hmm. I knew it was him. 
All I said was, how bad is it? <laughs> he, said, he says, it's messed up. I said, where are you at? And uh, he says, I'm at this hotel. And um, I'll use, and it was funny, I can't even say the name, but I'll use this name and leave it at the uh, bell desk. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, my wife's mad. I got to go. Maybe I can go downtown and stop by there. Mm -hmm. And it was just an alignment. Bennett, he had just bent the heck out of the neck. So I loaded up my truck. I laid down the tailgate and put a loft and life fixture, and I drilled it right into the to the uh, tailgate of the truck when you laid it down. I bolted it in, put a rubber bungee cord, shut it, tools in a toolbox that I thought I might need, put it in the back of the truck, boom, picked up my girls. <laughs> honey we have to make a stop at this hotel she goes i thought we we're going i said we are but i need to make a quick stop yeah so in the toolbox i put a, a flashlight mm -hmm. and all the tools i thought i might need to fix the putter right well, underground of this uh hotel and uh, there was pulled under a light in the underground parking laid down the tailgate got my wife's in the car grabbed my daughter's hand and she walked with me to get the putter um, we walk back to the truck and I have all the tools I thought I would need. So my, I lay down the tailgate, take off the bungee cord, set up my loft and lie gauge. Yeah. I give the flashlight to my daughter, four. Four years old. I'm here, sweetie. <laughs> hold hold the so, flashlight. Hold it so dad can do a little bit of a quick, uh, quick work right so here. So I have a crescent wrench and I have all my bending tools to get it back up there to get the neck straight. And so we spend... 15 minutes on this you know i know my wife's hotter than heck in the truck and we finish it we walk it back uh we give it to the bell guy i got it from said it's for this name and he knew yep. the name and um damned if he doesn't go out the next day and win the event and sometimes when you jump it ends up it ends yeah. up paying off <laughs> <laughs> and if he you know if he called right now, I'd take the phone call. I will always take that phone call because of the respect I think we have for each other. Yeah. But crazy things over the years like that, you know, with my daughter. What year was that? I, gosh, I bet that was 98 okay. through 2000. Okay. Um, and some of these crazy stories like that, just yeah. right place, right time, right tools, right product, right player, right. home run. You you made you made a, a pretty important putter for this for this player in '99, mm. and was did did the GSS that was used for that putter was that the first time that you had used GSS, or or, or did it did it have and for those that don't know, <laughs> GSS German stainless steel, okay. which is a head material that a lot of pros now use nowadays on on their on their Newport putters, but we're is, was that the first time you'd used GSS? What's what's kind of the, the story behind there? Well, I always, what is the best deal? What is the best copper? What is the best trillium? What is the best mm -hmm. that I can use? And I was, um, I was, you know, when sometimes when you get melted down to make a metal wood or an iron and melted down, you know, as crazy as it sounds, melting down um, knives and forks and spoons and they throw it and they liquefy this and that's what they're using and i'm like i want to use billet blocks of great materials and by the way what's the greatest stainless and it came the krupp or krupp family out of they design stainless steel for um guns and knives so they wouldn't rust mm -hmm. and so it was always coming back to this krupp family in germany so I got a few bars from this manufacturer of this German stainless steel. And ungodly expensive. Um, but again, I was after the best. And had a few blocks and I made a few putters. And this great player was in. He says, what's the best steel? And I said, what's this? He goes, well, make me something in that. Okay. And for example, he has a dot on the top of his sight line. Mm-hmm. And he said, I remember when he was in, he says, some days my eyes, when I wake up, I see the sight line left or right, not even just 
just so sometimes a line messes me up but he says I need a focus point so what about a dot because you know where to put it it's a focus point but the line he goes let's do it and he was there for a short time and I could have set up the mill and blah 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 I put it in a vise I take a, a punch hammer that sight dot after I teeter-tottered the head to find out exactly where the sweet spot in that dot was. So I teeter-tottered it, found the sweet spot, hand punch, boom, hand drill. So the dot in that putter was done by hand and by eye. Oh my gosh. <laughs> In the in the cherry bomb in the back though that was correct me if I'm wrong that was to to kind of hit a certain weight. Let's just call it. It was more of a look. Let's okay. we'll call it that. A okay. look of that you knew it was a camera, and like we talked about the Leica, mm -hmm. the red dots, so I could get it from the back, or I could get it from the face. Um, it had a look just like like a camera or the race car with the coming out of the hood the butterflies that red dot was kind of in a putter that's a Scotty Cameron right. so I always made sure it was cherry red just so funny that his favorite shirt he wears is red Sunday red I've, I've seen it recently I gotta say it's it's looking a little rough the, the cherry bomb in the back is, is missing some paint. And it's, it's I mean, it's one of those putters. Do you ever look at a putter like that? And it might, might not just be his, but one that's like a true gamer. And you see it and you're like, oh, man, you could probably use a trip to the, to the spa. Does, does it? What's so funny about that is <laughs> Jordan Spieth won't give me his putter. I was going to say, there's the another one right there. falling out. And I'm like, come on, Jordan. He goes, nope, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And... The great also is the same way, but what's so funny about that, how things inspire. Um, on the end mill, when I would put the dot, mill the dot in mm. the back, in the end mill, it's not always flat. Sometimes it's domed. So I'd make it deep enough so when I would put the uh, red ink at the time, red ink, right. it would cover it to be cherry red. Yeah. But because it was domed and you wipe your putter off all the time, the midsection that was higher would always rub off first. So it created, which we call now a lifesaver mm -hmm. look. So on some of our putter designs, you'll see a, just a red line instead of a big cherry dot, which was inspired by that putter of wiping off. And it would leave a lifesaver ring instead of a full cherry bomb inspired by that yeah do, do you ever think about that you you created arguably the most famous putter of, of all time i mean does does that matter to you i mean you you seem like somebody who loves who loves history and and loves just designing cool things but does does that matter at all to you at, at the end of the day when it comes to your legacy I just want to design great stuff and have great players use it. Um, I try hard, and I think the pat on the back is when you turn on the TV on Sunday and see somebody win, especially um, a major. Um, that that means like you've done a good job. But leaving a legacy, yeah, that's that's cool. That's cool. Um, at the end of the day, I love creating cool stuff. Uh, I, and I get really inspired when people love it, they use it, they talk about it, uh, whether they collect it or use it. I love, even today, the goal is to design just stuff that gets you excited. Okay, a couple more for you. I could spend hours, but I know Scotty has other stuff to do than just talk to me. Uh, which pro has the craziest Scotty collection? I've heard Hideki's is pretty legendary. But does anybody else come close to Hideki's? You know, kind of a secret closet collector, not collector, user. Faxon's got to have a good one. Faxon, but Faxon's friend, forgive me, senior tour, he just won. Um, Brett Quigley. Really? 
Faxon says, you would be amazed because he was forever and always a Scotty guy. Right. Um, Brett Quigley and a gentleman, a guy that you want to help and, and, and make stuff for it. His head cover collection and putter collection is scary good. But you're correct. Hideki. Yeah. I would I would love to like get a chance to see how good it is. I mean it's it almost feels like uh like an urban legend now. Like a decky's you wouldn't believe how great it is. It's it's the most incredible collection. I mean I see him out on tour and he has four or five Scotties in tow at all times. So some of the times pulling off head covers or they're Camerons I've never even seen before, but they're incredible. Hideki is that good when yeah. he asks you to jump, you say <laughs> how high. <laughs> And is that like a handful of guys that you would say yes, that about? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And like he, the Jordans and the Justins and yeah, and the Faxons yeah, and yeah. Davis Loves and many, 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 many Nick Prices and 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 we're not supposed to talk about names like that. Now get beat up on our website because we'll say so and uh, we'll say this player we can't use her name right and we'll say. Uh, this Sunday, this player used a Cameron mm. putter, and a lot of people are saying, hey, you idiot, just say their name. <laughs> well, we can't say, can't say their the name. name. You can't I say the name. I want to say their name, yep, yep. but legally we can't. Right. So it's it's not that I don't want to. It's like they think I'm saying not saying their name because I want to give myself more kudos. Right. We just can't say their name. Yeah. 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 But there, And that's I think it's a good point right there, which is there are so many players out there that use your putters that again they use your putters because they like it it's not because they're being compensated or or anything like that they just simply have grown up or they found a camera that they really like and that's yeah you got you got to play the game i i know i know how that how that goes um want to get your take on the future of the putter industry it feels like there's a lot of room for growth right now what's what's your take kind of if you were to take a pulse on the industry like where where do you see it right now and where do you see it going Well, a little bit, putter-wise, you're governed by cost. Mm -hmm. You're also governed by the USGA um, of design. You know, I'd like to make a, a tri stand and take the player out of it, and I took. But USGA states, and, and I believe in following those rules because they kind of uh, keep the game safe. You know, that you can't get goofy or weird or have crazy machines putting for you. Um, so we follow that um, costs are getting crazy. Um, so design is going to be governed by USGA and costs. Well, I can do wings. I can do big things. I can make MOI higher than any MOI of any putter. But you wouldn't want to use it because it would be so ugly and so big and so bulky. So taking all the rules and taking all the costs and then creating things that look good that you can afford. Again, the gallery was set up, <coughs> the gallery was set up to, um, I wanted to create crazy things and be able to sell those things and not be governed by costs all the time. Um, so costs, materials, the future, um, anchoring the putter. Um, I don't know if that should have gone away. Yeah. Not, not my call. Right. I follow the rules and do what we we can work with. Um, anchoring was a great thing. I don't ch think it changed the sport at all. I think, um, but costs, materials, um, different grips. I'm using 17 inch grips. I'm making 38 inch putters right now in this new line. We have one putter that's 38 inch with a longer grip um, that has become popular. Very popular. I never hopped on the arm lock putter. I just thought it was so awkward. Mm -hmm. And the guys went to that sometimes for desperation. And for me to use it, it was so awkward. I didn't think it would take off. But I do think this new 38 inch putter that some guys are requesting on tour, quite a few guys, that we needed to put it in the line because it is a very nice way to putt. It's heavier, it slows things down, it creates a great product. Unlike the arm lock, I just always felt it was awkward. 
So where is putting going? Uh, it's going to be materials. It's going to be, you're going to have to look at cost because as you know, putters in the industry, you know, you used to be able to do, buy putters, you know, for, you know, when I started, um, you know, the high, most highest end putter was seventy nine ninety five, and that was beryllium copper. So now putters on average for nice putters are $450 in the pro shop. So, um, and the engineering and the manufacturing of casting versus forge versus milled billet blocks, um, it's cost, it's design, uh, it's materials, and it's being creative with all those things that you have access to. Um, and I'm not bored with this at all. I uh, wake up every Monday and come in and just try to be the mad scientist and listen to the best players and say, how can I do this better? Yeah. Last one for you. How much longer do you want to do this? Mm. You know, I enjoy the heck out of this, as I've said, and I wake up on Monday mornings and still feel like coming to work. Um, but I, I definitely, that's a good question. I want to enjoy life um, with my family and my girls and my daughters. And, and um, what I have been doing is trying to hire the greatest people I could hire. So if I want to take a little time off, I don't feel so guilty of not being here 100% of the time. But I will always have my hands in this and um, ideas and thoughts and milling in my own workshop, um, my own studio. Um, but sometimes I have those days where I want to enjoy life a little more, but I want to make sure that I have the best people working with me so we can make the best products and continue on like we have. Scotty, this was incredibly fun. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming.